Welcome to NorCal Slot Car Scene. Today we're talking with Brad Bowman. Brad is the owner of Brad's Tracks in Escondido, California. Brad is considered to be the premier HO slot car track builder in the country. Brad, Brad has built hundreds of tracks, including one of my favorites, Rosemont Raceway, which I own. Um, and he's also built all the tracks at the Fray and all the tracks at the Coral. Brad, welcome to NorCal Slot Car Scene. Thank you, Matt. I'm happy to be here. Um, just to start, what, what, what is your background in racing? I know you were, uh, you were driving and you were crewing and pitting and doing pretty much anything <laughs> in racing. We could make a whole show just on that, just pretty much. Um, well, the first time we went to, I went to a race was when I was five months old. And my uh, years and years later, when I was in my 20s, I asked my dad, I said, um, when did we go to a race where we were sitting on a hill and it was really hot and mom was there? And he goes, your, your mom only went to one race. And that was the 1961 Times Grand Prix. And well, we were sitting on a red and white checkered blanket. And he goes, yeah, I took the tablecloth off the table. It was red and white and checkered. And he goes, how do you remember that? You were five months old. <laughs> so there's, I've had racing in my blood ever since then. We went to the Times Grand Prix again in 1971 and I was hooked and, you know, seeing the Can-Am cars. And, now, I wanted to be a driver, but that's a very expensive proposition. And uh, I, you know, I worked at the Jim Russell School in 84 and did a lot of driving there, race with uh, Johnny O'Connell and Tommy Kendall and um, guys like that. And, uh, you know, they went on to greatness. And I, I decided to keep wrenching because um, that's what I was doing there. And, uh, you know, I went to college and uh, got a certificate there and uh, got my first job on an IndyCar team in 88. Uh, pretty much as the gopher, but uh, they let me do some small mechanicing jobs. And uh, then it went from there, um, worked on uh, Indy Regency Racing with Ari Leyendijk. And then in 96, uh, we finished third at the Indy 500 with uh, Richie Hearn. And uh, then I went on to be an engineer on a Toyota Atlantic team in 88, uh, or excuse me, 97 and 98. And uh, then I decided, uh, you know, I'm getting a little tired of the racing scene because all the travel and all the sleepless nights and stuff like that I had to put up with. But um, decided to start building tracks at that around that time. So how yeah, so how did you get involved in the, in HO? Well, my first introduction to HO was um, Christmas of '71. My dad took me Christmas shopping, and we were going through pennies. And I saw these two boys playing with something on, on top of this really pretty tall table, almost tall enough for I had to get on my uh, tippy toes to get up there and look at it. And um, I pulled myself up and looked at it and I realized these two boys were actually controlling these cars. You know, I'd seen Hot Wheels before and I'd seen like motorific cars, cars you just put a battery in and set it on the ground and it goes on its own. But I realized at that moment that, oh my gosh, those guys are actually controlling these cars. And my dad was like, come on, Brad, come on. And I went, I wanna sit here and play this. And uh, he says, okay, you stay right there. I'll be right back. You know, something you wouldn't do these days. And, um, you know, it took a while for one of the boys to finally leave and I got to try it. And, uh, you know, I was hooked then and there. It was like an AFX set, you know, a two-lane AFX set that was set up uh, there at Penny's. And uh, that's where I got hooked. So how did, how did that translate from just, you know, kind of playing with toy cars? You know, to us, they're more than toy cars, but <laughs> playing and racing model cars into actually building tracks. Yeah, I think I, you know, I, I played with them obviously as, as a hobby and a toy with my friends in the neighborhood and stuff like that in the early 70s. And, uh, and in fact, my aunt came to visit one day during my birthday and she's like, what do you want for your birthday? And I said, a jigsaw, you know, like how many 12 year olds want a jigsaw? And she goes, why do you want a jigsaw? And I said, well, because someday I'm going to use it to build tracks or build myself a track, you know, because I'd seen the AFX mat, a manual and, you know, they showed in there people using a jigsaw to cut out, you know, wood to, to make a, a scenery set, you know, with a, all the scenery on it. And uh, I don't own that jigsaw anymore, <laughs> but it never got, never got a chance to build a track. But anyways, um, yeah, after I quit racing teams, um, my friend Jason Boy and I had, had built uh, the, our first track in 1995. Um, called Champion Raceway. And it, I think Slot Car Johnny owns it today. And uh, we were reading um, the rules for Hopra. And uh, it said that you had to have a completely flat track and you know there can't be any overpasses or any uh, hills or elevation changes. And we said, well, why do they say that? And that's because back in that day, they were 
clicking track together and maybe continuous railing it and everything. So there might be a joint that has a little bit of a peak to it and they were running the car so low, they would, they would bottom on that. And I said, well, I can make a routed track that has elevations that you know, won't cause any issues like that and just to prove them wrong. They also said all tables had to be four foot by 16 foot and stuff like that. I said, okay, I'll stay within that, that box because it's a, a convenient size to build. And um, so I, we designed a track and it turned out to be Champion Raceway. And Jason was a really good uh, modeler. Um, if you've ever uh, Googled uh, pictures of Le Monsico, that's his track. And um, so he did most of the scenery on it. I helped out a little bit with that, but I built the, you know, the working part of the track. And we took it to car shows and model car shows. And we took it to the opening of the Long Beach Aquarium because they wanted some racing themed thing there. Um, you know, it wasn't during the Grand Prix, but, you know, because they're in Long Beach, they wanted some racing themed thing. And um, everybody would just say to me, oh, this track is so awesome. I, uh, can you build me one? And I'm, you know, still at the, on racing teams at the time. It's kind of the overlap. And I'm like, no, I don't, I'm sorry. I don't have time to do that. You know, I barely have time to, to run on this track. And then after I quit teams, um, I said to myself, I go, so many people are asking me to build them a track. I'm going to start building them full time and see if I can make a living at it. And so therein lies the, the future of Brad's tracks. <laughs> well, that, that first champion track, uh, did you design that layout? Well, I, I got to give most of the credit to Jason. Um, but I did a lot of little tweaks here and there to make give it a little more character. He, I mean, he just basically drew, drew a figure eight that was bent over on itself with some squiggles for an S. What's it means? It's but, kind of know, legendary in that there's a lot of champion clones or champion like tracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I've built that exact or close to that exact design probably six, seven times, maybe more. Well, I'm, I'm racing on uh, one now. Sean Lee, a friend of mine that was in the Bay Area and moved to Sacramento. We race on, I think it's the third track that you ever built, which is a champion layout. Yeah, well, I think it's hard to say if it was the second or third because I was building kind of two tracks concurrently when I was almost three tracks at the same time. I was building um, Sean Lee's Seanadega, um, which was a tri-oval, um, six lane tri-oval with a squeeze lanes in turn one. I was uh, also building um, a road course for a buddy of mine who passed away from uh, testicular cancer about six, seven, eight years ago, um, Perez, and uh, we called it Circuito de Perez. And these are all tracks made with MDF roadway and, uh, and the second champion raceway. So that's champion raceway Mark II. Like I said, there's probably about six or seven of them out there. Yeah, I'm used to running on, uh, I think, Sentra-based tracks, but his track uh, that, that Sean has is an MDF track. Yeah, it's MDF. And it's my generation one rail. Um, which it's a very heavy a, rail, yeah, for yeah. sure. And there's a lot of carbon in it, so it messes up pickup shoes pretty easily. I just found it at a scrap yard, a metal scrap yard, and uh, I went, ah, oh, this stuff will work. I'll make it work. But it turned out it wasn't the best stuff. But so uh, how, how many tracks over the years now have you built? Oh, I've lost count. In the early days, I didn't take a lot of uh, inventory, and um, you know there was no accounting for all of it. And it also depends upon if you want to count just complete circuits or if you want to count like hybrid sections you know like i built like just a corner that has pieces of aurora track glued to the ends and people use that as a bank turn or a, a sweeping turn or an s's and i've also built like adapter tracks to go from one brand of track to another brand of track and uh, so if, if you count those in it's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 350 projects but complete circuits that were you know run on as a contiguous circuit um would probably be around the 300 range yeah. and, and you're obviously known for ho tracks but i've seen some 30 second scale tracks on your website as well yeah um you know i, I it's whatever people want to build i'm up for the challenge because you know I'm, I'm really good with my hands and i i enjoy the the challenge of designing things and building things and coming up with ideas on how to make them better how to make them work and stuff like that so yeah i've done 43rd 32nd um, I did only really one to one twenty fourth scale track, and it was just an oval. But those things are so big that um, I really can't build them here. I mean, even though I have a pretty big compound here, um, they're pretty big. And so we want to, uh, it, I would have to go to someone's house or their business and, and build it in place. It would make more sense than shipping it anyway. So 
Well, speaking of challenges, I think I know the answer to this, but what is the most challenging track that you have ever built? Yeah, that's a tough call because, because many of them offered up a lot of challenges. Um, it was probably a, a draw between the 24-hour uh, Le Mans track that got shipped to England because that was built in four or five installments. Um, and when I first the, built the first installment, there really wasn't a plan to complete it. I just said, when I was over there racing on it, I, there was this one section of track that was really bad, the Ford S's. And you, it was almost impossible to drive through it without falling off because it's such a big track and you're entering at such a high rate of speed and you're going from, because uh, it's an eight lane track, you're going from six to fit outer of 15 to the inner of a six to the outer of 15. So it's really difficult to go through there. And so I thought, well, if I could route this section, it would be a lot smoother and, and, and probably let, trip you up less. And so I offered him, I go, can I route this section of track? And uh, he said, yeah, you know, we'll use it. If we don't like it, we'll throw it away. <laughs> and if we like it, we'll, maybe we'll expand on it someday. So I ended up building all the way from the Ford S's through Dunlop, um, the, the S's and Tete Rouge, which is a basically parallel straightaways before the S's and then onto the Molson back straight. So it was kind of like the first quarter of the track. And so, and I didn't take really good measurements, unfortunately. I don't know why. And um, I thought I had, but when it came time to finish the track and, and, and make the end come together, I wasn't certain of the distance. So I, I, I made it like three inches longer in the sense, because I wasn't doing any of this stuff in CAD, it was all pencils, drawings on paper. I took that. And I, I thought to myself, well, I think it's this long, but if it's three inches longer, I better add that three inches. So I added the three inches when I got there, that three inches overlapped and I ended up having to cut it off with a zona saw. And uh, so if I should have just gone with what I what thought was right in the first place, but uh, there was no big deal. And it, the track went together just fine. And it's now a 232 foot eight lane track with a 99 foot straightaway. And that would be the so biggest there, show track ever built, I would guess. Yeah, probably one of them. I mean, there might be some larger than distance, but they might be just click together tracks. But this track is set, set up once a year, usually in November, for their 24-hour race. And uh, they have it up on tables now. Originally, it was down on the floor. And so you had to marshal while sitting on the floor. But now it's up on tables and you sit in chairs. And, uh, you know, uh, they usually used to race uh, Tommy Turbos there. And a quick lap there was like a 15-second lap. And then you, most people know race Tommy turbos. Now they're pretty quick cars with a 722 tooth gear. So um, I took one of those Hot Wheel speed guns um, one year to find out how we were doing in the straight, straight line speed compared to everybody else. And I saw 26 miles an hour, which is really fast for an HO car. Yeah, and a stock arm and stock magnets. So, so well, when, I, when I said I thought I knew, my guess was going to be the purple mile. Yeah, that was the other one. Um, when I said it's kind of a toss up between the two because the Purple Mile was never fully assembled here. And again, it was one of the last tracks I built before um, I had my CAD machine. Um, so it was just basically a hand-drawn, hand-cut track. And it, turn one there is 56 degrees of banking. You know, Peter Lentros that owns the original Purple Mile, the 24 scale one, where it's 65 feet from end to end and 220 feet lap length, um, said, Brad, I want you to build an AHO version of this track. And so, you know, after going through many pictures and drawings and stuff, I, I came to the conclusion that it, to be a purple mile in 64th scale, which is what most people consider HO scale these days, it's not. HO scale is 187 in the United States. Um, but um, that needed to be 82 and a half feet long. So, you know, I was drawing it in CAD to come up with the dimensions so that it turned out to be 82 and a half feet long, but I still had to cut it. I've been to Peter's place, a uh, very nice guy. He invited us back there one time for a race. And you go in and you see the 24 scale track, which is, which was originally at Playland in San Francisco. I think there were only yeah. two purple miles ever, ever made. Um, and then you go back in the back and you see he's got an HO version of that same track. It's mind boggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, like I said, I, I never fully put it together. I mean, it was a complete, it was meant to be a complete plug and play track in sections. And so I plugged individual sections together to make certain that they go together, but it's 32 feet from end to end. 
and I really don't have that much space here. So it never was a one continuous track and, and able to test it out, you know, and I, I made little plugs on the underside of the track. So each section can, you know, jump her over to the next section. And he flew me out there. He was too worried that someone there wouldn't be able to assemble it. And so he flew me out there and I had it up and running probably in about 35, 40 minutes, maybe max. And we just, you know, bolted the table sections together. And I, I made it with fold down banquet table legs and clicked together the electrical and hooked up the power supply. And we were running laps in no time, but you know, I was a little worried, but uh, pretty confident in my ability. So I, I was pretty- and That's, sure that's that an eight lane track, correct? Yeah, that's eight lanes. They only really run on the six center lanes these days because the gutter lanes are really challenging there. Yeah, I did. I did get to run on it once, and it's just, it's just, it is like I say, it's it's mind boggling. It's one of those Grand Canyon moments. You see that, and your jaw drops. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Kind of, I guess. So what's what's the? I know there's a couple other tracks that I have in mind that you've built that are just, uh, again, famous because there's nothing like them. One is the KSR, the Cat's Park. Yeah, yeah. Well, the story behind the KSR was um, the first member in our club that we were running in Northern California in the '90s. Um, Jason and I, um, his, first, his name was Greg, Greg Katz and Greg wanted a track from us, but he was living in an apartment at the time and he had a pretty good job and, uh, he ended up buying a home in Fremont and <clears throat> adding a room to the back of the house. If you ever go on uh, YouTube, there's a video of him, um, you know, touting his track and, uh, asking him about, he went to the city to find out what's the biggest room he can add to the back of his house legally. And, uh, then when it was done, he said, Brad, you know, fill this up with a slot car track. And that's, uh, you know, we, we figured, okay, you need about 18 inches on each, on three of the sides and about two and a half feet on the driver's side for people to get by. So that yielded a 10 by 31 foot track. And again, Jason did the, did most of the, the design on the drawing of the circuit, but, uh, you know, I tweaked a couple of corners here and there to make it a little more, uh, not challenging, but uh, have the flow a little better. <clears throat> and um, so when cars left the track, they would leave going towards the, the marshals instead of out into the middle of nowhere, although that still ends up happening. Um, and I, and we, both, we both definitely wanted to recreate Eau Rouge and Radion from the F1 circuit in Belgium, Spa Frankerchamps. You really do get the feeling in miniature or as close as you can get, like you're, you're driving on Spa. Yeah, it, well, it, because of the downhill and then uphill through the little kink, it's just, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, because of the elevation changes. I mean, the highest elevation off the tabletop is 22 and a half inches. We were shooting for two feet, but that just made it too steep and somewhat unrealistic. I mean, if you, if you look at the cat's bar ring, you say, hey, this looks like a real track, but it's only the size of a parking lot. It's two scale miles, a little over two scale miles, but, um, you know, if it were a real circuit, it would it wouldn't be very big because it doubles back on itself a lot. But you get that feeling, and that was the thing we were trying to accomplish: that you were going somewhere. You weren't just lapping a circuit like a you know an oval or figure eight or something like that. that you, you, get, you get to feel like like you're more racing on a real track instead of like these yeah. two or three second laps where uh, yeah. you know you you feel like you're in a, a sort of a toy car race if you want to call it that. But, yeah. Get much more, it, plus all the landscaping. So, I remember seeing the monorail and he said, the monorail works. Yeah, That's if cool. I put batteries, <laughs> they get hung up though, unfortunately, that the track is, not, it goes under the scenery and loops back around, come back out and look like a northbound or southbound line or east or west, whichever way it's facing. And uh, when it was in Greg's house, Jason wanted to call it the Fremont area rapid transit <laughs> train. So um, anyways, <laughs> Yeah, you, so the track you can imagine what F A R. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when it goes underneath the scenery and loops around, sometimes it gets hung up there, and we forget about it, and it burns its batteries out and wears a little dimple in the track from the dry wheel. It only has one dry wheel, but yeah. Now we were keen on making a you know that work, and then the the grandstand also has a, a Mercedes emblem that spins around and, and some lights that shine on it and stuff like that. It has a fluorescent tube that runs the whole length of the garages, and when you you plug that in it shines down into the garages so it looks like the lights are on yeah awesome so we're, we're running up against our time limit here on on the, the zoom chat so uh before i go i want to first of all i want to say thank you and uh 
it's a great tribute to uh, Greg Katz, the track, and there's a 24 hour race. I'll put links uh, in the chat down below so you can find out about that. And I raced with Nate Katz, Greg's brother. And Nate, ironically, or however you want to say it, races 30 second scale. He's not much into HO at all, but I raced with him quite a bit. Right. Well, technically, well, Nate owns the track. You know, he inherited it when Greg passed away. So I'm just the proprietor. And, and it's great because that track went from Fremont up to San Francisco. And it's been taken apart two or three times by people that really care uh, about Greg and the track. And it, it's it's it still exists. And it's at your your shop in Escondido. So that's that's awesome. Everybody involved in it. A lot of my friends are involved in it. And obviously, you have a great deal to do that. So the, the HO community thanks you for that. Um, as a closing, you know, if people want to build a track, how would they get in touch with you? And I'll put links down below as well. Sure. Um, well, Brad, if you Google Brad's tracks, I'm, I'm the first thing that pops up. Um, you can try bradstracks.com. Sometimes that works in some browsers. Sometimes it doesn't. The other time you have to put the, the slash FSMRA who hosts my website. You're going to have to add that to the end. And there's pictures on there of pretty much every track you've built. So it's a, it's a good pretty website much. to just to browse. Click on my, my website's really old. I built it in like 1998. I haven't had much time to update it. So, but there's a link there that says list of tracks I built. It takes you a real boring page of all the lists, but you each, almost everyone has a link to the picture of the track that I built. Yeah. Awesome. Brad, thank you so much. Uh, like I said, I'm a proud owner of a Brad's track called the uh, Rosemont Ring because I used to live in the Rosemont area of Sacramento and my last name is Rose. So it just all worked together. Uh, I have an awesome track. Uh, everybody that has a Brad's track is I know is happy with it. So thank you very much for taking the time. No, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Jim.